All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician. Tonight, talking about constipation, chronic constipation, also referred to as functional constipation versus irritable bowel syndrome type C. And hopefully, I'll give you some clarity on these two conditions, really, the overlapping details of both of them, maybe some ideas. Uh, of things to explore. Now, this is medical advice, which is topics for you to better understand and uh, consider. So, without further ado, I'm going to. <clears throat> oh, goodness. So, that's not the right slide. Hang on. That's, we're going to hide that one. Forgive me. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring this one in. Okay. All right. So, and good evening to everyone who's joining. Uh, IBSC is um, and different from chronic constipation, also referred to as functional constipation, in that irritable bowel syndrome type C is going to have distension and pain associated with it or bloating, whereas your standard chronic constipation or functional constipation is going to just involve constipation. Now, there are a number of different uh, etiologies of constipation. Uh, from the doctor side, some of the first things we think of include thyroid disorders, Parkinson's disease, something called Hirschsprung's disease, where the colon does not develop the right nerve plexus. You see that in kids. And so that is what we are thinking on the doctor side. But the reality is once uh, some of the big factors are eliminated. There are some, there are many nuances to this, and hopefully I, I can show that slide next. But the major pieces to the puzzle seem to be a chronic stress response emanating from the brain, as well as perhaps a post infectious etiology where you may have had food poisoning, and then that food poisoning changes how your nerve plexus in your gut is sending signals which then affects motility. Once motility is affected, either because of an infection or because of chronic stress, then as a result, you can get overgrowth of bad bacteria. And if these bad bacteria produce a lot of methane, and then you're gonna have a propensity for constipation because methane slows down bowel transit, whereas something like uh, hydrogen sulfide gas increases bowel transit and is associated with diarrhea. So we'll hide that one. Let's show this one in the stream. <clears throat> I like this, uh, this slide because it really goes over some of the histological features, just so you can get a, a grasp of all the things that are being talked about in the literature. Clearly here you see psychosocial distress uh, under environmental factors. Foods can be really important, uh, gluten, is a common cause of constipation. In fact, one of the most common presenting symptoms of celiac disease in adults is constipation. Medications can lead to constipation, certain supplements can do so. Antibiotics, you know, if you're taking antibiotics, then that may result in constipation as well as the enteric infection. So the gastroenteritis that I mentioned before is, is really gaining a lot of notoriety. We used to think that post-infectious IBS accounted for 10% of cases now. That number um, is thought to be much higher. Um, and I'll talk about that later on. Uh, luminal factors, as you can see up here in the slide, dysbiosis. Dysbiosis just means uh, an imbalance in your gut bacteria. Uh, previously, it was referred to as candidiasis or candida overgrowth. Neuroendocrine mediators, bile acids. Bile acids are incredibly important. And I talked about bile acids relative to the liver. Bile acids, um, you can think of them as changing the oil, so to speak, in your car. Uh, it's thought that maybe if we put in fresh bile acids and certain bile acids, it can be really beneficial for the gut bacteria because these bile acids are just recirculated between your intestines. Uh, they get absorbed and they go to the liver and they get recycled. Host factors, uh, altered GI motility, hypersensitivity in the gut altered brain-gut interactions, intestinal permeability, and the gut mucosal activation. So these are all the things from a histological and pathophysiology standpoint we're thinking about 
for those who struggle with chronic constipation or IBS type C. Okay, so let me show this in the stream, and then we are going to hide that guy. And, um, this. Um, it's important to know that constipation typically is, the chronic constipation is lasting longer than a few weeks. It uh, doesn't mean that you didn't have a bowel movement for a few weeks, but you've had this constipation cycle more than a few weeks. So if you, you eat a, some meal and then you're unable to have a bowel movement for a couple days, that's not necessarily chronic constipation. It has to be an ongoing issue. Uh, IBS-C sufferers can also have periods of IBS type D. And so IBS type D is IBS with diarrhea. There's also the mixed type of IBS where you can go back and forth between the two. Uh, and there are the many uh, conditions that I discussed. All right, so let's see here. We're gonna show the medical model. Oh no, I'm having trouble tonight operating the BeLive, so hang with me guys. Uh-huh, okay, mm -hmm. okay, here is the medical model. The medical model um, frequently in recent years involves drugs like Ambitiza, yeah, drugs like Linzess, they've been really popular. Stool softeners are commonly recommended. Seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist is oftentimes a, a secondary approach. For those with IBS, exercise is recommended. Antibiotics such as rifaximin may be recommended if SIBO is found. SIBO referring to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And increasing fiber. So Metamucil uh, is a common one that's recommended, or Benafiber. So those are the typical recommendations that I see coming out of a gastroenterology office. Whereas the functional model, It overlaps with that, but functional doctors tend to recommend probiotics more often. Uh, things like the low FODMAP diet, supplements like Atrantil. Atrantil, I believe, was uh, it's a supplement for small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and it was discovered by a gastroenterologist. It involves the, the Quebratio extract, and it does help with bacterial overgrowth, but you have to take it for, I think, a year for it to be clinically effective. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Stress reduction, uh, magnesium supplementation, resveratrol can lead to increased bowel motility. Uh, when you read the GI literature, you'll basically see that prebiotics like fiber, probiotics, antibiotics, they're saying that all of it's good. Dietary changes are good. It's just finding that right match for the individual. Uh, that's the most important thing. But out of all the totality of the, the things I quoted in the uh, pathophysiology section of this topic, I will say what I have found to be the most important factor is the brain. So working with the stress mechanism in the brain, uh, it's more complicated than just telling somebody not to be stressed. Um, typically the person is not able to shut off their stress response. And that's due to the fear center in the brain, way deep down in here, uh, hopefully you can see, Deep in the brain, in the medial temporal lobe, right in there, um, we have an area called the amygdala, and the amygdala is our fear center. And unfortunately, because of situations like childhood trauma, which significantly increase one's probability of having uh, IBS type C and other forms of IBS, that fear center can be too dominant, and it can produce lots of cortisol and adrenaline through the years. It has hardwired connections to the gut which can slow down or alter motility and secretions. And that can be a driving force for sensitivity in the gut as well as things like constipation. And then also we really have to pay attention to the effect of infections on the, the plexus of the gut, which is sending signals to improve motility. And what they found is that infections basically trigger these things called CDTB antibodies, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, and then they also trigger these things called vinculin antibodies, and we can now test for these. And these antibodies uh, literally form after a GI infection, like you would consider the stomach flu. And then that stomach flu triggers these antibodies that then attack your nerve plexus of your gut. And that could be really bad. 
Those are the big factors I see because then they foster imbalances in the gut bacteria, which then produces abnormal methane. And then that leads into the cycle of someone having chronic constipation. So hopefully this gives you some knowledge. Again, in my experience, the brain and the infectious component are really big. And then downstream from that, looking at how foods interplay with your gut bacteria, what supplements or referrals for medications are necessary to change the landscape of your gut bacteria are important. And then things to keep motility moving on a consistent basis. So that's the Gates Brain Health Review on IBS type C and functional constipation. Thank you everyone who joined and uh, hopefully I'll be back soon with another broadcast. All right, have a good night.